The control Z command is one of the most powerful, powerful things that we have on our computers. For some of you, you don't know what control Z is because you don't know how to use technology. <coughs> but in our laptops, there's a button called uh, command or control. And there's the letter Z, you press these two and it undoes all the mistakes that we've written down or it um, corrects or it saves, it retrieves things that we did. That is a powerful, powerful thing. How many of you have ever been uh, saved um, with homework or something that you were writing, an essay, and you made a mistake, but you had Command Z? Come on. Weren't you grateful for Control Z or Command Z? I, you have no idea how many times I'm typing sermons, and my goodness, I make a mistake and I lose everything, but I can Control Z and everything comes back. Yeah. Well, this is what this Control Z or this Command Z would be so amazing for life. Life would be so much easier if we had a command Z, control Z option. Yeah. Yeah. Where after we make a certain mistake that we made, yeah. caught in a moment where we didn't want to be in, we can control Z and take it all back. Yeah. Life would be so much easier because then we wouldn't have to live with the weight of our regrets if we had a command Z or a control Z. Yeah. There are certain things that you've said that I've said. Someone say amen. amen. That we wish we can control Z quickly. Um, there are some things that we did not do on time and we wish we can go back in time and do them so that we could actually have the results or the outcomes that we wish that we had. Yeah. Isn't that true? Yeah. The good news is that we can start over even without a real undo command. Mm -hmm. The Bible gives us a promise and that promise is found in 2 Corinthians. Read it with me, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. creation. This is talking to both women and men. The old has gone and the new has come. So what is, the, what is the new start that the Bible is actually talking to us about? And why do we need a new start? You know, we're talking about control Z and that would be so crazy and so beneficial for life. But the question is, why would we need a new start? And I'll tell you the reason why. The reason why we need a new start in our life and the reason why God even gave us this option of having a new start in our life is because of one word, three letters, sin. Sin is you missing the mark. Sin is you having things that are displeasing to God. And I know that a lot of us think that sin is a nasty word and a lot of us think that sin is not a good word that we should talk about because that's very old school. And it's not progressive enough. And it's not modern enough. And it's just, you know, what my parents used to believe in but not what I believe in because times have changed. Time can change, eras can change, but what is eternal never does. The Bible tells us that everyone has sinned. Criminals, bankers, doctors, prostitutes, moms, dads, boys, girls, all of us have sinned against God because we are all under the same condition. Sin has brought consequences in our lives. The penalty for sin is death, which is eternal separation from God. So this is the first thing that you gotta understand. Every single one of you is a sinner, including your pastor. We are all sinners. We're all bad, we're not good. We are bad people who do good things. Yeah, yeah. That's true. And a lot of you might be already um, kind of like having the lawyer in your right shoulder, left shoulder pop up and tell you, hey, that's not true. You are a good person. You don't steal. You don't murder. You don't do this. You don't do that. And so there's a lot of what the culture can tell you that defines you as good. But if you are a Christ follower, you cannot allow culture to be the definition of your perspective. Yeah. We have a different way of defining our terms. We have a different way of defining life. We have a different way to look at life. And that is through the word of God. And the word of God sometimes will contradict what the world is telling you. So my question to a lot of you here today, your followers of Christ, my question is this. What determines what is right and wrong for you? The world or the word? Because there will come a time where you will die. Mm-hmm. Everybody here is terminal. Sooner or later, you're going to die. Thanks, Pastor, for encouraging us today. <laughs> but the truth is that. And when you die, you are going to meet with God. Yes. And you're going to have a, a meeting with the Lord. Yes. And it's going to be face to face. Yes. And right then and there, the Lord will decide your destiny based on your decisions. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so that's why this topic of salvation is so important because a lot of people are living a deceived mindset. So let's re summarize. There is an undo button. 
And that is God promising you that you can, if you are in Christ, all things are made new. Amen. That's your restart. Mm -hmm. But the question is, why do we need this restart? The answer is sin. Sin is what we all are. We are all sinful. None of us are purely good. And there's a definition of good based on this world, but there's a definition of good based on God's standard. So today I want to show you a video that I've showed countless times. And I've showed it since I started our church. And uh, the title is, um, Are You a Good Person? And I want you to actually listen to this little video. It's a cartoon. It's really powerful because it actually explains this really well, just in case you think that you are a good person. You ready? Three, two, one, go. Meet Mr. Nice Guy. You think you're nice? This guy is really nice. Well, I try to do what's right. He's so nice that if good people get to heaven, he'll be the first in line. Ah, oh, shucks. So, Mr. Nice Guy, have you kept the Ten Commandments? Pretty much. Do you mind if we take a look at them and maybe see how nice you really are? Uh, okay. Great. Here's one. You shall not lie. Mr. Nice Guy, have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah. Who hasn't? What do you call somebody who tells lies? A liar. All right. How about another commandment? You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen anything, even once? Nope. But you just told me you're a liar. Well, I, I did steal some candy once when I was a kid. And what do you call someone who steals? A thief. All right, let's try another one. You shall not commit adultery. Oh, that's easy. I'd never cheat on my wife. Hi, handsome. Oh, baby! <clears throat> Jesus said, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Oh, uh, right. One more. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Have you ever used God's name to curse? Oh, my. That, Mr. Nice Guy, is called blasphemy. God gave you life and breath and everything you have, and you've dragged his name through the dirt. So, by your own admission, you're a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. And that's just four of the Ten Commandments. Okay, okay, so I'm not perfect. Well, actually, it's worse than that. Suppose we could put a chip in your brain that would record all your private thoughts for an entire week and then play those thoughts on a giant movie screen for all your friends and family to see. That would be embarrassing. Yeah, I know. The Bible says God knows everything, even the secret thoughts of your heart. Well, compared to some people, I'm a saint. Yeah, that's true. But the standard is God's law, not other people. Besides, even if you sin just five times a day in one year, that's 1,825 sins. And if you live to be 70 years old, you'll have broken God's law over 127,000 times. You'll have to answer for every sin on Judgment Day when the Bible says each of us will give an account of himself to God. But God will forgive me, right? Well, let's try that in court. Hey, look, I know I keep breaking the law, but hey, catch up. Well, you know, just let it slide. Only a corrupt judge would buy that. A good judge would say, Justice demands that you pay for your crimes. God's not a corrupt judge. He's a holy, righteous judge. He hates sin. Jesus warned that on Judgment Day, everyone who had sinned against God would justly end up in a terrible place called hell. And there will be no escape for all eternity. Uh, well, then how can anybody get to heaven? There's only one way. God loved the world so much that he sent his son Jesus to live a perfect life. He never sinned, not even once. Then Jesus offered to take the punishment for guilty sinners. He was whipped and beaten, and nailed to a cross, and died so that justice would be served, and sinners could go free. Then Jesus rose from the grave and defeated death. You can't earn eternal life. 
It's God's gift to everyone who will humble themselves and come to Jesus. He'll forgive you, wash you clean, and give you a new heart with new desires. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So stop living for yourself. Turn from your sins and come to Jesus. Then read your Bible and obey it. Find a good church to help you grow. And then go out and tell other people the good news. There it is. Here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who's all? You. Me. All of us. So anybody that kind of stands here and says, no, you can't call me a sinner, then you're calling God a liar. Because the Lord deems you as a sinner. Um, God's standard of good equals perfection. And how many of you here are perfect? This is why I love our vision statement. We create a space of grace for? Imperfect people to create God. Yeah. So we create a space of grace for imperfect people because we've recognized that we're all in need of a savior. And if you are not a sinner, then that means technically that you can just automatically save yourself which takes away the need of Jesus and you're disqualifying his sacrifice. Yeah. So any of you here that are having a hard uh, time embracing the idea that you are not a good person, that you are actually sinful, you're broken, and you sometimes do good things, right? If, if, you, if you're wrestling with that, it, let me bring it down and boil it down to you. It's, it's, it's a topic or it's a matter of humility. Yes. You, us humbling ourselves before Jesus, knowing that we need him that there is no one like him and that we definitely, definitely must depend on him specifically when it comes to our salvation. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So we're all sinners and that means that, and and the wages of sin is death. That means that without Jesus, we're all going to hell. And this is why when we come to church and we only, you know, can worship for about an hour, 30 minutes, maybe an hour and 45 max on a Sunday, Uh, We give him everything that we've got. We give him all our hearts. We give him all our attention. We give him our focus. Why? Because we've understood that he's given us everything that we need. And what matters most is not really the blessings that you can have in this life, although they do matter. What matters most is the blessing that transcends that transcends this 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 life here on earth, and that is eternal salvation. It's you being saved from the wages of your sin. Um, A couple questions: Have you ever felt separated from God? Right? Have you ever felt like? Nobody hears you when you pray or that God is a distant force. People who feel this way think that if they just go to church, know more about their religion, or do good things, they will be closer to God. So sometimes we we, we get stuck in certain moments in life where we're praying and we don't hear God or we don't even pray because we feel like God doesn't listen to us. And uh, it seems like God is just some distant being out there in the galaxies. And so we're like, hmm, maybe I'll just go to church, uh, learn more about religion, and be a good person. And we think that that, like our moral behavior or our good deeds or doing religious things, we think that that is what grants us access to God. And that is not true. All these, all these things fall short of God's justice. Yeah. The justice of God demands a sacrifice for our sins. So you got to understand that coming to church is amazing. Doing good things is awesome. But God is looking for something a lot more than that. He's a just judge. And your sin must be paid for. All the times that you lied, someone's got to pay that. All the times that you've been rude to your parents, someone's got to pay that. All the times that you did sexual sins, (coughs) whatever they may be, someone's got to pay that. Because God, his nature is, he's a just judge and he must consume sin. Now the question when it comes to you and me and our eternity is, who do you want to pay for that? You or Jesus? Who who do you want to pay for that? And and this is where Jesus says, I've come to pay for your sins. Jesus is so powerful that he paid for your sins before you said yes to him. It's like when two people are in love, right? And the girl knows that her fiance's, I mean, her boyfriend's about to propose. She knows. And before he does, she already made up in her mind that she's going to say yes or that she's going to say no. (laughs) Someone say amen. Amen. 
But it's so beautiful, right? Like, it's so cute when the guy's planning it and he thinks that he's getting away with it. She knows. All those mysterious, like, outings with her best friend could be a good thing choosing a ring or could be another type of thing, which we don't want to talk about. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, we're getting out of rhythm. What I'm trying to say is, um, you know, when there's a guy that's going to propose, the, the girl already knows in her heart. Before he asks, I'm going to say, yes. This is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to save you before you even say yes. I'm going to save you before you even are respectful towards me. I'm going to save you before you even worship me. I'm going to save you and say yes to you before you even acknowledge me. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is not the religious man that your parents or your churches or in the past you've seen on YouTube preach to you. I think that we have a really wrong version of Jesus in our secular society. And that's why nobody wants Jesus. But it's insane to me to hear what he has to offer and say, no, thank you. It's insane to me. And I think that religion wants you to follow a whole bunch of rules, measure up, and then you can give your life to Jesus. And you have to get this right, and you have to get that right. And a lot of people sometimes don't want to get anything right before they meet Jesus. And so they say, I'd rather not have him because I don't think that I can fulfill what he wants. And what you don't understand is that Jesus is the other way around. Yeah. You, you, you say yes to him back, and you allow him to transform you. Yes. The transformation is not based on you. Yes. The transformation is not something that he demands of you. Yeah. What he demands of you, what he asks is this, will you say yes to me? Yeah. And if you allow him in your life, he's the one that is in charge of navigating you, teaching you, showing you, and even bringing up things that you've buried down there beneath yeah. your soil of the heart. And he brings it up so that there could be change. And yes, there are moments of confrontation. And yes, there are moments where God is going to challenge you deeply. And yes, there are going to be trials. And yes, there's going to be hard times. And yes, there... But what there isn't is, there isn't this thing where he asks you to change. He's not asking you to transform yourself because then you are disqualifying him. He wants to be the one that leads you into your transformation. And that requires healing. And that requires uh, him showing you things about yourself that you didn't know from childhood. That requires freedom. That requires chains being broken off your life. That requires him breaking patterns that have been passed on from your family onward. Yeah, he's the one that is in charge of navigating that in your life. You don't have to start with transformation. You start with grace. <laughs> now, I want to give you some salvation misconceptions. In other words, what salvation is not. Number one, a family inheritance. <laughs> I hear a lot of people going, well, my grandma's Christian, bro, so, you know, I'm good. She prays for me. Your salvation is not based on your grandma's relationship with Jesus. I'm so sorry, dude. Another one is this. <clears throat> Parents that are not really, you know, following Jesus closely, they're following Jesus distant-wise, they think that because their children are close, that they're going to be close. That's not true. So whether if you are a son or daughter, and your parents or your grandma was a Christian, um, your salvation is individual. Your grandma, your auntie, your mama, your dad, everybody in your family, your older sister, your older brother can pray for you. And that's amazing. That's a blessing. Don't take that for granted. But none of them can save you. Yes. Yes. Only Jesus can. Yes. And so if your faith is based or your salvation is based off what another relationship with Jesus is with somebody else in your family, you're very confused. You have not understood salvation. That is a misconception of salvation because your salvation is not inherited from your family. Yes. <laughs> your salvation is an inheritance from Jesus. Yes. <laughs> that means that you must be connected to Jesus. Yes, yes. And if you're a parent and your children are following the Lord and you're not, I'm so sorry, your children are amazing, but you need to be amazing too. Amen. 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 You need to follow Jesus. Misconception number two, church attendance. Mm. This is a big one. <coughs> a lot of people think that because they come to church that they're saved. Mm. Your church attendance is not your salvation. Yes. It is a part, it is a fruitfulness of salvation because when you are saved, you want to be around God's people, you want to be around God's presence, you want to be around worship that worships Jesus, but that does not mean that you are saved. 
a lot of people come to church and they think that because they came to church, that, that means that they're automatically saved and boom, it's over. And so they come, they fulfill a religious duty. They sit down, they listen to the sermon, they clap some, some cute songs once in a while. Sometimes they'll lift their hands this far or sometimes even this far. And when they're really like getting pro, they're all out, right? And they think that that equals redemption and salvation. Yes. And I want to correct that today. Just because you attend church does not mean that you're saved. You can be in church 365, but that does not mean that you're saved. Salvation comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes with that comes people just robotically coming to church. Like, well, I went to church today, so hey, I did my Sunday thing, got my Starbucks on my way. <laughs> and now, like, I'm good. On with life. If, if, if what you do for God is just a part of your life and not your life, Yes, then you got to really reconsider and examine yourself. Because when someone is saved by Jesus and they have that new heart, everything that we do for the kingdom of God is not a part of our life. It, it becomes our lifestyle. It is our life. And that's why we hear Jesus saying, seek first the kingdom. He didn't say seek first your church on Sunday for an hour and a half and then you're good the church is part of the kingdom prayer is part of the kingdom fasting is part of the kingdom you know you actually aligning yourself to the pattern of, of, of biblical lifestyle that is seeking the kingdom of God and its righteousness so please don't get confused in thinking that because I show up to church on Sunday once a week that I'm saved no a heart that's been saved does um, it, it gives a lot more fruit than just that it's good that you come to church, but a heart that has been transformed, it, it, it's different soil. Yeah. And in fertile soil springs forth life and fruitfulness. Yeah. Yeah. So the question that I need to ask you is this, is the only fruit that you're bearing right now, is it only church attendance? Mm. And if I were to ask you, do you even know what else there is to bear? Would you know how to reply to that, that question? Because as a person that's been saved, right? That means that you're following Jesus. And to follow Jesus means that your life completely turns upside down. Yeah. You no longer live for yourself. Yeah. I no longer live for this world. I no longer live to achieve the things that this world has. I could be successful. You can be successful. Yeah. You can have a good career. You can build your family. You can have a nice house. You can buy a lot of nice things. But your heart is not attached to that yeah. because your heart has been transformed. Yeah. Misconception number three, baptism. A lot of people think that, well, I was sprinkled as a baby, so I'm saved. No, you're not saved, you're sprinkled. I see a lot of guys, right? A lot of, a lot of young guys that have, they're in their like, what, early 20s, you know, they're like 18, 19, early 20s, even mid 20s. They're so stuck on being cool and tough and they're so stuck on just like, looking apart and I get that because I've been there <clears throat> but I, I want to tell you guys that there's so much more to life than that and and your life really generally matters in the season of your life and right now in this season of your life you need to understand that Jesus is seeking you yes having nice cars and nice clothes and you know having cool piercings and nice hair I get that I got that. I think that you should continue looking great. Represent Jesus well. Yes. But if that's as far as your vision in life goes, then you're, you're miscounting steps. And you're not thinking about something that is so much more real than your looks or what people think about you. You're, 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 you're miscounting the steps. And here's one important step that most people don't realize. Eternity. Yes. That's so much more real than how fresh you could look with your nice haircut on the weekends. I remember when I was young, that was the greatest worry of my life. <laughs> my haircut. Like I have to have my haircut every week or sometimes even two weeks. Every two weeks, every week. And that's, how, that's as far as my worries went. How, how funny, right? Sad. And now that I'm older and I'm seeing you know, people die, sometimes uh, people that are close to me, uh, dying young, uh, that, that shakes your world a little bit. 
um, especially when you understand what happens to a soul that passes on from this life to the next one without Christ. Yeah. yeah. So I, I say all this because I, I sometimes get into conversations with a lot of young guys or young people, and they go, oh, well, I was baptized as a kid. And I'm like, what does that mean? Well, you know, like, you know, like, I got wet by a holy man. He, the priest sprinkled me. And, and we associate that with having good standing before God. And I'm here to rectify this and tell you that you being baptized as a child or you being baptized, period, does not equal salvation. You will never find that in scripture. It is a requirement and a, and a step of obedience that we must take because a lot of you don't want to take that step either because you're, you just don't want to get wet in front of people. <laughs> feels uncomfortable I remember I was a chubby chubby little kid I was 11 years old and I got baptized at my church and they gave me a white you know those white robes everybody's robe was fine everybody's white robe was fine they got in they got out nothing and I was like this huge chubby 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 kid with a lot of rolls everywhere okay and I was so ashamed of being chubby because I got bullied in school and frick I was the only person that got the see-through robe so I get baptized, I come out, and everybody's like giggling and laughing because I was just wearing my whitey tighties. And my, all my chubby little body was just like showing, and I didn't know it until we watched the videotape at home with all our family. I had no clue that whole weekend that I was visibly visible until my whole family came over and we watched the tape together. That was so embarrassing. But a lot of you don't want to get baptized and, and, and you, you might have an argument, I don't need to be baptized in order to get saved. And you're right, you don't. But it is a step that the Lord wants you to take to publicly show the world that you're a follower of Jesus. So how many of you here need to get baptized? We, we might do baptisms in, on Easter. Number four misconception of salvation is works. This is called legalism. That this depends on your behavior. That your salvation depends on what you do and what you don't do. That your salvation depends on how well you follow the rules. That is a misconception of salvation. Jesus never, never put salvation on you. None of you could ever think that it depends on how well you behave. Because then you would have something to boast about. Salvation is a gift Amen. that we receive by faith. Yes. So this is where um, I, I grew up in a lot of legalistic churches where um, the women had to wear dresses in order to come up here and sing. If you were um, a, a guy that was going to come up and preach, you had to wear a suit. Because if you preached like me, you're from the world. I have a lot of my old pastors um, and people that I used to go to church with that if they were to come to our experiences, they would call us lost and we are in the world and that we're not saved. And they would criticize me because they would say that I'm leading all these young people to hell. And, and, and where do they base um, their opinion from? I'll tell you this, not the word. And if they do bring a verse, it's misapplied. Yeah. They base it all on human structure. Because as human beings, we have this sinful need to feel achieved. That rhymed, so that's really good. I was not planning that, but praise God it was good. <clears throat> we have this desire to earn our goods. You want nice clothes? You got to work hard to have the money to buy your nice clothes. You want a big house? You got to work your butt off in order to have the money to buy your good house. Mm -hmm. You want to have a nice body? Well, obviously, you got to work your butt off, right? Yeah. To earn that nice body. And for those of you that got that easy, uh, I had a friend one day. <laughs> I had a friend one day that we were all at home. And my friend asked, how do people even get fat? I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> that question offended me so much, I didn't even reply after that. But I forgave that friend yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But typically speaking, if you want something good, you gotta work hard for it. And we have this thing intertwined in us that we must earn. 
the way that legalism works is that we apply that mindset, that shortcoming in our human nature, and we apply it to God. And this is why sometimes you will walk into a church and you have to follow a whole bunch of rules in order to get saved. This does not mean that we do away with rules. Rules are boundaries that we need in life. You understand what I'm saying? So legalism is rules that get you saved. It's based on my works. It's based on what I do, how I do it, how I perform it, how well I do it. If I do really good, then God loves me very much. If I do mediocre, then God loves me medium. And if I do really poor, and I don't read my Bible every day, and I don't pray for 30 minutes a day, and I don't fast once a week, for some of you, once a year, and if I don't go to church, then God does not love me anymore. And if I fall with this thing six months in a row, and I try not to do it, but I end up falling, then God must be so tired of me. That, my friends, is a legalistic mindset. And there's so many of you here, because of the way that your upbringing was, or the way that you grew up in church or at home, you bring that legalistic mindset to the Lord, and that's why so many of you run into guilt and shame and condemnation all the time. And it's not that you're not saved, but, you know, you can drive a really beat up Toyota Tercel. Or you can drive a nice 2022 Toyota Tercel. Or a different car. Let's go Lamborghini. Amen. Amen. Which one do you think has a smoother drive? The Lamborghini. Which one do you think is more comfortable, easier going? The Lamborghini. The Toyota Tercel has no more AC in the summer, so you're screwed. And if it's leather seats, oh my gosh, that burns. Or very cold in the winter, right? Okay, legalism is like that old beat up car. You feel like you're on a mule, right? And if you have this, I'm so sorry. Just for analogy's sake, okay? But you have a Lamborghini, or let's, let's, go, let's go a little bit more, more, more uh, achievable, uh, a Tesla. If you have a Tesla, drive so smooth, okay? So this is why Jesus comes and he says, do, do you want the Tercel legalism? Or, or, or do you want to actually lay down your human structure and receive my grace? Where you can be free. Mentally free. Soul level free. Where you depend not on you, but you depend on me. This is why so many people hate God. Because the world has gossiped about him and people have a misconception of God. And they don't understand that God wants to set them free. That God wants to love them. That God wants to heal them, make them whole. Because it's never based on you. It's not on your works. It's not legalism. It is based on grace. And here's the last one. Reincarnation. It is appointed for man to die once and then face God. That's what the word of the Lord says. You're not going to turn into a butterfly, dude. <laughs> and if you're a really, really bad person, okay, you're not going to be a pee. I mean, you're not going to be a tree where like dogs can pee on because you deserved it. Right? That's how some of us think. Like, I'm going to be a tree when I, when I reincarnate and dogs are going to peel over me because I deserve it. I've been a bad person. That's not true. That's not true. You're all bad. We're all sinful. And there's no such thing as reincarnation. Yeah. Yeah. After you die here, your spirit, your soul, you're before the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. True. You're before the Lord. You're not here from a past life. Okay? You were not a rat traveling the streets of New York. <laughs> and that's why sometimes you have dreams. I think I need to move to New York because I can feel my past life. <laughs> that's just a lot of YouTube videos that you watch. Seeing people... Okay, so... You understand reincarnation is not a form of salvation. Yeah. If you want more on this, I have an article that I can pass on to you so that you can read it. There are 14 misconceptions. I only went through five. So what is the solution? What is the solution to this whole entire problem? Here's what you need to know. God is holy and just. He is holy and, and just. Can I get everybody's participation on three? He is holy and what does just mean? We should know because we're in a generation that is demanding a lot of justice right now. Yeah. That's what this whole generation is all about. Justice. Yeah. 
You know what's crazy? I, ta I taught my leaders this, that sometimes rebellion is masked as justice. People have a rebellious spirit and they want to rebel against authority and they use the mask of justice. I'm doing it for justice. Really? I don't know if you're really doing it for justice. But that is not what we're talking about today. God is holy and just. He cannot tolerate sin and allow it to be unpunished. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are sinners? If your hand is down, I want to meet you after this. I want to shake that hand. Get your autograph too, please. We'll frame it right there on top of our vision statement because you surpassed our vision statement. Once again, how many of you are sinners? <coughs> okay, good. God needs to punish that sin. So this is where we understand that he is holy and he's just and that sin cannot go unpunished. It needs to be paid for it. But God is also loving and he's compassionate. Amen. Amen. He does not want us to be separated from him forever. And so because of this, he provided the solution to our situation. Because he loves us, God gave his one and only son to save us. This is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, him being Jesus, who had no sin to become sin for, say it with me, us. So that in him, who's him? Jesus. So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. But I just like slipped up in porn last night. But I just cheated on my spouse this morning before coming to church. That would be pretty bad, right? <laughs> but, but, but I just stole money from a boss on Friday because he left early. But I lied 15 times over the weekend because I was not at Citigroup, I was at the club. Okay, 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 now listen, 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 listen. Let's say these are all bad things, right? The, the lying aspect, the cheating aspect, the sexual moral aspect. And God wants to call you his righteousness. God wants to call you his own righteousness. He wants to attribute, amen. He wants to attribute a good virtue of his to an imperfect human being. I'm so sorry if you're having troubles reconciling this, but I'm not saying this. This is the word. And how is that possible? It's possible through Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect life. You never will. Also, the balance of this is not that you're going to keep living a sinful lifestyle because you know that Jesus got you and he's your homeboy. Because that's called liberalism, which is also not salvation. Yeah. This is, understanding this makes us respect God. Yeah. Understanding this makes us want to live for him. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. So Jesus became that sacrifice, the one that we needed in order to get saved. And he paid the penalty and all the consequences for our sin at the cross. He exchanged his righteousness for our sins, took our curse, and gave us his blessing. Because he is sinless, because Jesus lived that perfect life, listen to this, he is the only one. Someone say only one. Only one. My one and only. Say it. My one and only. My one and only. Jesus is the only one, your one and only, who can pay the penalty for people's sin. And he's the only one that can bridge the gap between God and man. Yes. Nothing else, no one else. First of Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all. Once for all. Once for all. So many people want to keep offering sacrifices to God so that they can pay God for their sins. Jesus' one and only sacrifice is sufficient. Have you seen some people from different cultures in different parts of the world that they actually like get crucified? And they actually go on crosses? Why do they do that? Because they want to please God. And God's like, I don't need that. Instead of pleasing me, you're offending me because you're saying that what my son Jesus did was not enough. And some of you do that, but you do it in a low key way. You don't go and get up on a cross and get nailed for real. But you do other things where you punish yourself. 
where you try to offer sacrifices in order to measure up for God. But what you're essentially saying is that Jesus' sacrifice was not good enough for me. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, once again, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. So salvation is found in Jesus alone. He died and rose again so that we could receive forgiveness of sins, be restored to a relationship with God, and have eternal life. This was why Jesus died. This was why Jesus died. He rose again for you, and he rose again for me, so that we could have eternal life. Say amen. amen. This is why he says in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. Say no one. No one. No one. No one. Nobody. No one comes to the Father except through me. So a lot of people have a problem with this because they go, Christians are so narrow-minded. And I would say that Christians are not narrow-minded because Jesus wasn't. He's just specific. Okay? So, for example, if anybody here wants to go out and eat at Per Se Social House um, in downtown, it's a restaurant, really good restaurant. They got the best burger, just letting you know. The best burger. Go try it. Let's say you want to go there with your city group, right? And you asked me, hey, so pastor, you said that in the sermon, you had a, the best burger that you've ever tried is that per se. How do I get there? What if I told you? Just follow your heart. <laughs> just, 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 you know, do your thing. Because any road that you take, you can go on Southwest Marine Drive, okay? And go east, or you can go north, or you can go south. Because all these roads will lead you to per se. Okay. How many of you would be like, you're so wise. It's like, I love this pastor. He's so progressive. How many of you would be like, no. I can't go south, north, east, or west and expect to arrive at the same location. Because logically speaking, that does not correspond to reality. Yes. Yes. How many of you would call me narrow-minded if I gave you directions to the restaurant? If I said, you know, take Granville, you gotta go north, get on Camby Bridge, cross the bridge on Camby, and literally like four blocks after on that same road from Camby Bridge, it turns into Nelson or Smythe. You'll see the restaurant on your right-hand corner on Homer and Smythe. Imagine if some of you came up to me like, you're so narrow-minded. I can't believe this, Pastor. Oh my gosh, Marlon. I'm not even going to call you Pastor. Marlon. I'm going to call you Marlon now. How many of you would call me narrow-minded because I give you specific directions to a, a certain destination? That's what this world is doing to God. This world is calling God narrow-minded because he's trying to get you to his mansion in heaven. He's not narrow-minded. He's specific, and he's trying to let you know, I made a way for you yes. because I love you. Yes. Your perfect, finite little self you who thinks you've got it all figured out because you live in Vancouver and you go to UBC or SFU. And the worst one is when you're just completely unemployed, you're not in school, <laughs> and you think you know it all. I feel like God sometimes has to do a lot of this. Oh, my son. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Jesus is the only way. And um, it's nobody else. Nobody else. Salvation is based on God's grace. On what Jesus did on the cross for us, even though our salvation cost him so much, he gives us his grace for free. And watch this. I want you to catch this. Maybe tattoo this in your soul. We can never save ourselves. Someone needs to write that down and put it on their home screen. I could never save myself. We can never save ourselves or gain God's approval with the good works that we do. So... In essence, we need to stop trusting ourselves. Some of you need to stop trusting yourself. And realize our need for God. 
and turn away from our sin. It is when we put our full trust in Jesus and ask him to be our Lord and Savior that we receive this gift of salvation. This is why Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 9 say this. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God not by? So that no one can? boast Romans 10 verses 9 to 10 says this that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved say amen Amen. for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved can someone say simple simple that's how Jesus likes it we as human beings just like to overcomplicate our lives And it's worse because then we like to complicate other people's lives. Because we like to have a complicated life. We want others to live a complicated life because when we start seeing them live in freedom in the grace of Jesus, we're like, I don't like that because it should not be that easy for them. Jesus didn't come to complicate our lives. Jesus came to save us, to give us freedom, to give us grace. So I have some food for thought and there are four questions that I want to ask you. And this is where your application is going to come in. Question number one, have you stopped trusting in yourself and started trusting in Christ alone to save you? Read that question. Sounds like a simple question, but it's actually a deep one. Because a lot of you struggle with, a lot of Christians around the world struggle with legalism. And the the, the children of legalism, what legalism births is condemnation, Shame and guilt. There's so many Christians living under the shadow of their fear of God in a guilt, shameful, and condemning way. It's not a fear of God where they respect Him. It's more like they want to run from Him. And and you're a prisoner of legalism. And legalism is trusting yourself. So although this question seems simple it actually can be applicable to so many people that have been in a church for a long time. Are you like, are you done trusting in yourself? And now you can trust God. So when you mess up and you make a mistake and you were not premeditating it, because if you're premeditating your mistakes and you're premeditating your disobedience to the Lord, I don't know if like you, you need to get saved. You may not even be saved, but if you've given your life to Jesus and there are moments where you stumble and you make mistakes and they're not premeditated and you want to stop, My question to you is this, after you make that mistake and you slip and fail, can you stand on grace and be like, I know the Lord's covered me, I just need to repent and ask him to help me? Will you stop trusting you? Second question, are you willing to turn away from all known sin? This is a next step for some of you. That there's something in your life that you know God does not want. And sometimes sin... does not need to be a bad thing. It could be a good thing God is asking you to give up. (coughs) Because even good things can become gods in our life. And at the essence of sin is just, honestly, it's not even about rules. It's just obedience. Because sometimes we point at like, you know, stealing, lying, murdering, sexual sin. Those are like the big things that we talk about at church when we are defining sin. But what about God asking you to give up Netflix as your escape to feel at peace? What if that's what God is asking you to give up and you're refusing to? Then even though you're not technically doing something morally wrong, you are still under disobedience. What if what God is asking you in this season of your life is, I need you to change the worldview that you have from culture to my word. And I know, listen to me, I know that that is a tough battle. And and, and I want you all to know that I'm not asking you to switch your worldview to Marlon's worldview. My worldview has no authority. I can advise, I can counsel, I can share on my experiences, but that's not the final authority. God's word is the final authority. And that's the one brush the church should be painted with. The word. 
not the pastor's preference. Not your mama's preference. Not how I grew up or my traditions. And definitely not the world. This world is more confused and chaotic than it's ever been, I think. So what if the Lord is asking you in this season of your life, hey, I need you to um, surrender your worldview to me and I want you to take up my word and follow. All known sin. Sin has to do with obedience versus disobedience. Number three, have you confessed Jesus as Lord and Master of your life? Some of you need to confess Him as your Lord because you do all the stuff, you come to church, but you've never, you've never professed with your mouth, He is my Lord and I receive you as the Lord and Master of my heart. So for some of you, that is your next step today. Yeah. We're going to make a prayer after the fourth one. It is if you confess with your mouth and you start to follow Him. This is what the Lord requires. And number four, are you willing to follow and obey Him for the rest of your life? Food for thought. So, there are some of you in here, you need to take that third step today. And some of you in here, you need to take that third step. Maybe it's your second time taking it, and that's okay. Or maybe even your third, because you received them, you walked away, you received them, walked away, and you've done that. But maybe today... <laughs> Maybe the Lord Jesus Christ is calling you back because you possibly walked away from your faith. And now Jesus is saying, I want you to walk back in because I miss you. And I want you. So if that is you, then today you can make this confession or this statement over your life for your soul. Okay? And the rest of us, we're going to help the people that are making this prayer from their heart. We're going to pray it with them. Okay? So if you understand this, in short, the gospel in one word is Jesus. In a sentence, Jesus gives us grace and saves us from sin. And the way that we receive that forgiveness and the way that we receive that gift of salvation is by believing in Jesus, number one, with your heart. Number two, confessing him as the Lord and Savior of your heart. And number three, following Jesus. So there's some of you that need to take that step. Today you've believed and now you need to confess. And thirdly, you need to follow. Okay? So if that's you, we're going to make a prayer right now. Close your eyes, bow your heads. If tonight you need to receive the Lord, you know it, I want you to pray with me. and Repeat this prayer after me. Father in heaven, thank you for speaking to me, for never leaving me or forsaking me. I bless your name, Jesus. Lord, today, I rely on your sacrifice, not my behavior, only what you did. And in this moment, I confess you as the Lord and Savior of my soul, my life. Forgive all the wrong things that I've done, all the sinful things I've invested in. Today, I ask you for your help. Break me free from the power of sin and allow me to be a new life in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for your son. In Jesus' name I pray. We say, amen. And we congratulate every person that made a decision today. God bless you.